Mamba Byte is a method for doing token-free selective state space modeling. This project was led by Jungsheng, Tushar, and Nathan. Like always, we're going to be doing language modeling. We would like to model the probability of a sequence of words. However, to do this, we first have to pick a tokenization scheme. We could use words themselves, or we could use characters. Of course, in modern language modeling, it's common to use subwords, which are automatically constructed groups of contiguous characters. Over the years, various papers have proposed to instead model the bytes directly to do language modeling. This process has several nice benefits. The first is that it tends to be more robust to noisy distributions and properties such as misspellings. It's also interesting as a way to do single stream multimodal models. If we can work on bytes, we don't have to build in any prior that we're working with language at all. Finally, bytes may allow you to avoid certain artifacts that come up from the choice of tokenization. I don't want to argue that bytes are a perfect way of representing language, but they do present an interesting modeling challenge that we don't see in tokenization-based models. When working with bytes, we're working at a much finer resolution. Each individual prediction is easier, but we end up having to work with sequences that are four times as long. This really shouldn't matter so much from an information theoretic point of view, but it really does make things much more complicated when working with deep learning based language models. Handling longer sequences has some nasty problems when working with models like transformers. Like all models, transformers require you to determine the tokenization up front. Once you determine this tokenization, the actual computation that is performed is quadratic in whatever the length of your sequence is. Naively, this makes it very hard to use lower granularities than subwords because sequences get extremely long and you end up paying a quadratic cost. This also manifests itself in inference time because the cache that you need to keep around is also going to grow linear in memory in the length of the previous generation. Passwork has looked into ways to get around this issue. In particular, the main baseline for this work will be a paper known as Megabyte, Inspired by the use of patching in computer vision models, Megabyte proposes a clever architecture that breaks down the byte level input into patches, feeds these into a global model, and then uses a local model to do byte by byte generation. This effectively eliminates the bottleneck of length while still allowing you to get the benefits of a byte level generation based model. This might seem to offer the best of both worlds, but you have to be a little bit careful. Patching is cheaper, but as you patch more, performance degrades. And when normalized for compute, all versions of these models perform roughly the same. So while the patched models remove the penalty from attention, they don't give you a kind of magic bullet for handling longer sequences at a finer granularity. Motivated by this property, we were interested in exploring what a new class of alternative architectures would do for the byte level language modeling problem. We'll focus particularly on the Mamba architecture, which provides a competitive method for doing language modeling where time does not scale quadratically in the length of the sequence. The core neural network component of Mamba is shown on the right. The blue shapes represent standard linear layers. They both project up from a lower dimensional to a higher dimensional representation. And the COMV and SSM components represent linear time operations over the time series of the sequence. These two green components basically replace attention in the model itself. To understand why Mamba may be useful for byte level language modeling, let's dive a little deeper into how the SSM component works. We're going to first start with a standard recurrent neural network. Here, the recurrence uses a hidden state to memorize information about the past sequence. That recurrent hidden state is updated each time the update to the hidden state is based on the input, in this case, the representation of the next byte, and then the byte after that is predicted from only the hidden state itself. In Mamba, the SSM hidden state will be quite large, so don't think of this as a small vector, but as some large compression of all of the previous bytes that we've gotten so far. The particular recurrent method used in Mamba is known as S6, or a selective state space model. This selection mechanism uses the next input not only to update the hidden state, but also to gate the previous hidden state. This allows properties like filtering out unneeded bytes or resetting the hidden state as you go. 
you can think of this selective mechanism as somewhat analogous to an LSTM or a GRU, where we're basically allowing the model to have extra control over the hidden state over time. The main benefit of a state-space model over methods like recurrent neural networks is that the hidden state update is linear. This means that given a sequence of bytes, we can compute all the necessary hidden states efficiently with a parallel algorithm. In this example, each of our input bytes will be at the top of this slide, and we'll be interested in computing the output representations at the bottom of the slide. We're going to see how we can do this in parallel using a state space. The first observation is that because the updates are linear, we're able to compute them in any order. This is taking advantage of the associativity of the operations. That means we can combine time step one and time step two to compute their hidden state, and at the same time compute the combination of time step three and time step four. We can then combine these intermediate time steps to produce the necessary output state. If it's helpful, you can think about this as computing a binary tree. Once we have this tree, we can then use it to get all the intermediate states as well by combining our intermediate values with the values at the previous layer of the tree. This is really cool. It gives us a very large hidden state representation that can scale linear in the length of the sequence. This means we can basically apply these models to byte level input and be able to process it without paying any sort of quadratic penalty. In theory, the size of the state should be roughly the same, whether we're handling byte level models or full on subword or even word level inputs. Of course, this trick only works if we can see all the input bytes. This is true during training, and it's true during prefill, but it's not true when we're generating output. We have to generate one at a time, and so if that one is bytes, it's going to be a lot slower than if that one is subwords. We'll end up paying a lot of cost in terms of just loading the weights in so that we can generate each token one at a time. However, I'll argue that this is a little bit misleading. It's much easier to generate bytes than it is to generate words. So we really shouldn't have to pay that cost in a theoretical sense. So to get around this issue, we're going to use a strategy where we use a token level model to try to speed up the inference of our byte level model in practice. We're still going to get generations that basically come from the byte level model, uh, but we'll see that the token level model gives us a strong benefit in decoding speed. Okay, so this approach is known as speculative decoding. We're going to have a draft model that is a standard tokenization-based recurrent neural network. This model will generate one token at a time, left to right. We'll start with the words the cat, and this model will generate the word sat and done. Once we have these generations, we're going to verify them using our byte level model. Note that because we have all the bytes, we're able to use our efficient parallel scan just to check whether these tokens we're in the top three bytes at each position. In this example here, the first word sat is in the top three of our byte level model. And the first two bytes, D and O, are also in the top three of that model. However, when we get to the letter N, it's no longer in the top three, so we have a conflict. Given that we have a conflict, we need to rewind to the last position of agreement, which is the letter O. We then utilize our byte level model to generate bytes left to right in the standard recurrent neural network style. We do this until we hit a tokenization boundary of the other model and can start speculating again. Now our last word was the word down. We reset the draft model to that prefix and we continue generating forward. Here the next three words are on the map. We can then feed these into the byte level model for verification. And in this example here, we see that all of these characters are in the top three of the byte level model. So we've confirmed that this was a valid output. Cool. So based on these two ideas, that Mamba is a good fit for byte level modeling, and that speculative decoding allows us to get back some of the benefits of inference time efficiency, we're going to run a large set of experiments comparing Mamba byte to various other models. We'll see four different styles of models in these experiments. The first is a full-length transformer. The second is megabyte, which we've seen already. That represents a two-staged patch transformer. Next, we'll see gated S4, 
which is another linear time architecture, which is known to be less good on language modeling than Mamba. Finally, we'll compare both to Mamba Byte itself and to Mamba run on a tokenization-based input. As with all modern language modeling experiments, it's important to both compare across different number of parameters and different amounts of compute. Since we're not going to be training frontier models, we have to understand how these models scale and how this impacts the final output of the system itself. So first off, we compare Mamba Byte to other byte level models. In the first set of experiments, we attempt to compare models that use similar amounts of compute per byte. The main comparison here is between Megabyte and Mamba Byte. We find that Mamba Byte, even though it's trained on 60% of the bytes, is able to obtain better loss across five different data sets. This indicates that Mamba is indeed a very good fit for byte level language modeling. In fact, I think these tables kind of underplay what's going on here. What we're seeing is that per the amount of compute actually being given to the models, Mamba Byte is just getting much more information out of its training data. Mamba Byte seems like it has a much better curve than any of the other models we compared with, and therefore it's able to reach a better loss with many fewer training steps. We were also able to scale Mamba Byte up to a much larger size on this one data set. We again see that even seeing many fewer bytes at input, Mamba Byte is able to obtain a much better loss than competitive models. We've been primarily focusing on training compute, but utilizing a model like Mamba also allows us to have much better generation speed. Compared to transformer-based models that have to maintain a very large cache and use that as part of generation, Mamba Byte can use pure RNN-style generation and just produce one byte after the next. Doing so, we're able to achieve much better generation speed compared to transformer-based byte-level models. Finally, another benefit of using Mamba is that it naturally length generalizes. Because it is naturally a sequential model, it doesn't really need any tricks to take into account longer sequences. Just off the shelf, the Mamba byte model is able to generalize to sequences of length 30,000, whereas the transformer-based models taper off after a certain point. So Mamba Byte is better competitive with other byte level models. But really the goal here is to do full on large language modeling. So for this to be competitive, we have to also compare to subword level models. First off, let's justify why this is even interesting at all. This is a benchmark from the Byte T5 paper, which introduces various forms of synthetic noise into a data set. Models are judged by how well they're able to handle this noise in terms of language modeling. Here we can see that when we compare the Mamba Byte model to a standard Mamba model with tokenization, we see large improvements of handling byte level representations versus the ones with tokenization. There's clearly benefits in the inductive bias of the model itself and also what it's able to see in the input that allow it to handle hard changes in input representation. Beyond these representation benefits, we can also see that Mamba Byte is very competitive with other subword models on these data sets. In particular, when we compared our Mamba Byte implementation to a fair comparison with a Mamba using tokenization, we see that the models reach roughly the same test perplexity, with Mamba Byte obtaining a better result but using more compute during training. These models are also comparable to transformer based subword models as well as various other subword models that have been tried on this task. I'll note that besides for the row on Mamba, all of these results are from other papers, and it's not normalized for amount of compute or training setup, so it's hard to directly compare here. Finally, when comparing subword-based models to byte-level models, it's fair to bring in the speculative decoding that we discussed in the previous section. When we do this, we can see that we're able to get a 2.6 times relative speedup when using speculative decoding with Mamba Byte. This makes the byte level model comparable in speed to the full subword Mamba model of a similar size. In order to compare how well this did, we look at the final probability that Mamba Byte gives to the generated sequence. We can see that we're not able to recover exactly the same sequence that Mamba Byte would have generated, 
but we recover basically 90% of the log probability of the original sequence. If we compare this to what just a generation from Mamba would have produced, we see that it's actually pretty different than the sequence we would have gotten from Mamba byte. This indicates that the learned byte level model is actually pretty different than the tokenized model, but that using the tokenization can give us a speed up when we have the Mamba byte model for verification. I think these results are pretty promising, and they indicate that there's probably a lot of interesting things you can do to further optimize these RNN style models. Cool. So in conclusion, I think these are really promising results for using a Mamba based model. It really seems like a very nice fit for byte level generation. In particular, disconnecting length from the effective amount of memory used gives us a whole new design space for trying out different models with different sorts of structures than standard transformers. The current models are still behind super optimized token based models, but they beat patching token based models of the same class. Generation speed is still a challenge, but we think methods like speculative decoding give us a way to really speed up byte level based models and reach competitive speeds with token based models. Thanks so much for listening, and you can check out our paper on the archive. If you're interested in this topic, I also have another tutorial that describes Mamba more in detail and describes other researchers' work using this model in practice. I'll post a link in the comments below. Thanks.